I'm going to start today's lecture, which is the continuation of last week's lecture. So last week, we spoke about performance dashboards and about, we started to talk about process mining, especially about process maps. We even saw how to draw a process map manually, just to be able to understand what does it mean. When you see a process map, you need to know what, what is the meaning of it. Um, and you did an exercise about it in the lab session, in the lab session last week. Um, we also spoke about abstraction and filtering and how important this is because real life processes, when you take the data out of the system and you try to visualize it, are very, very complex, as you can see in this uh, screen. And it's very useful to abstract, to filter them. And we ended up with a demo. Uh, and I show you how you can take an event log in comma separated value format in CSV format, how you can import it into a, a process mining tool concretely into Apromore, and how you can start, you just double click on the log in Apromore and it discovers a process map and, and how then you can change the statistics that you display on the process map. As I said, process maps are very difficult to, to visualize entirely. Some processes are simple, so you can see them 100%, but most processes are quite complex, so you cannot see them 100%. So you have to play around with the sliders. And another thing that we saw last week was uh, filters. And now is lecture number 13 of this course, and is the last uh, uh, lecture. Uh, and uh, we are going to finish with this topic of process mining that we started in the last lesson. I stopped last week on the topic of filters, event log filters, and we saw a number of filters. Uh, I mentioned that there are two filters that are not very frequently used, which are the case variant filters and the case ID filters. It's good to know they exist, but usually you will you will rarely use them. But there is one type of filter that is very commonly used, which is the attribute filter. The attribute filter is a filter that allows you to retain those cases, those executions of the process where a given activity occurs. For example, I want to see all those purchase orders where there was an amendment of the purchase requisition, I would use an attribute filter and I will point to the amendment task and I was in the attribute filter and I will say, I want all those cases that have this task. In a loan application handling process, for example, sometimes there are tasks related to fraud assessment. You know, the bank needs to know if you are going to be a fraudster or if you are going to be delinquent on your loan that you are requesting. So they have some uh, risk assessment tasks. Uh, you might want, for example, to look for all the cases where the task investigate potential fraud was executed in the context of that process. Then you will use an attribute filters. Bear in mind that attribute filters do not only allow you to filter by cases that contain a given activity, but also cases where a given resource was involved or cases that contain at least one event that had a certain value on one of its attributes. And that's why it's called an attribute filter. Now I'm gonna demonstrate you concretely, what do I mean by being able to filter cases where there is at least one event whose attribute value is X? Let me take, um, let me go here and take a, to a Promore. And I'll try to open a sample event log. This is an event log that I showed you last week, um, taken from a hospital information system. And it contains a process instances corresponding to treatments of patients in a hospital. Every instance of this process is one patient who was treated as a hospital for some type of cancer. 
there are 1,150 cases. As you can see, the process is very complex. So to simplify it, of course, you can use the abstraction sliders, but the abstraction sliders, they are just removing some details of the process, which means there are things you are not seeing in this picture when you simplify it. They don't give you a complete picture of things. So an alternative is to filter. And for example, I can define an attribute filter. At, I click on the, on the filter icon. I go to the attribute filter and I could retain only those cases where an intravenous antibiotics treatment was applied to the patient. But I can also change the attribute here. And for example, I can pick the age attribute and I can filter only those cases where the age of the patient is, for example, uh, more than 65 years old. When I apply here and I say, okay, here, I have retained all those cases of patients who have an age of 65 or above. And as you can see here, there are only here in the number of cases, there are only 756 such patients out of 1,150 who have been treated, who have been treated in this, in this hospital and whose age is greater than 65. I can then um, remove this filter. There is a button for removing all filters. And I'm gonna define a different attribute filter. Uh, for example, I'm gonna define an attribute filter and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna retain those cases where the patient has had a diagnostic, a blood diagnostic, a diagnostic based on a blood test. There is an attribute for that called diagnostic blood. If I pull down the list of attributes, I can see it, diagnostic blood, and it can be true or false. I can retain only those cases for whom, for of patients for whom we did a blood diagnostic and this diagnosis, diagnostic return true. So, so I click on OK, and I can see that there are only 823 cases out of 1,150 cases where the patient underwent a blood diagnostic. And I can filter by any other attribute I want. The other type of filter is the time frame filter. The time frame filter allows you to retain only those cases that are contained within a given time frame, as the name calls. That's why it's called a time frame filter. Uh, for example, I can retain only those here. Here I see that this event log started in November of 2014 and it finished in June of 2015. Imagine that I am only interested in those patients that were treated in the year 2014 and not those that were treated in the year 2015. I will define a time frame filter and I will only retain those cases that fall inside the year 2014. So I, I, I adjust the time frame here with this slider and I put it on the, say, the maximum date should be 1st of January. So I apply the filter and only those cases contained in the year 2014 are there, which is 925 cases out of 1,150. So there is another type, I'm gonna remove that filter and let me add another filter. Uh, there is another type of filter called the performance filter. And the performance filter is a type of filter that allows me to retain only those cases whose duration is below a certain threshold. So for example, if I wanted to retain only those patients who spend at most four weeks in the hospital, I will put the upper bound here to two, four weeks. That means, as you can see in this diagram, that only those patients that spend less than four weeks in this process will be retained. I apply this and I get only 836 cases. So 836 patients were treated in less than four weeks. The remaining 300 patients spent more than four weeks in the hospital, or perhaps they had even to return to the hospital multiple times. 
This same time filter, if you play around with it, you just have to be a little bit um, inquisitive. Uh, you will see that you can also filter by total waiting time, by average waiting time, by max waiting time, or by the duration of an arc. If you look at an arc in the process map, which is a directly follows relation between two activities, you can use this type of filter to retain only those cases where the time spent between, for example, the intravenous, the, uh, the uh, intravenous uh, uh, liquid treatment and the CRP treatment, where that was less than three weeks or less than four weeks. So there is a lot of ways of filtering by duration, duration of the total case, total waiting time, average waiting time of the activities, maximum waiting times, etc. And uh, uh, finally, there are other types of, of, uh, of, of filters, path filter and reward filters that are very useful for the purpose of conformance checking and performance mining. I will come back to these filters towards the end of today's lecture. So what you need to know is that if you have an event log and it contains say 1,000 or 3,000 cases, sometimes event logs contain 10,000, 1 million cases, you can filter some of these cases or some of these events and focus only on a subset of them. And then you can perform a more focused analysis of your process, focusing on those cases that really matter for the question that you have to answer, the analysis question that you have. Before I close on the topic of filters, um, you see in a business, pro in an event log, every instance of the process, also called a case, is represented by a sequence of events. The filters that we have been showing until now are filters that retain all the cases that fulfill a condition or filters that remove all the cases that fulfill a condition. And they retain entire cases or they remove entire cases. A case is made out of many events. Sometimes you don't want to remove entire cases from your event log. You just want to remove or retain some specific events in your process. Let me illustrate you that. Let me remove all the filters. Let me simplify a bit this process. And let me say that, you know, Marlon, I am only interested in analyzing what happens between the moment a patient goes from this activity called ER sepsis triage to the moment they are admitted in the admission. This is admitted in intensive care. Admission IC means admitted in intensive care. Admission NC means admitted in non-intensive care. And then I am interested in knowing when the patient was released. So I'm not interested in looking at all these activities, IV liquid, IV antibiotics, lactic acid, leukocyte, CRP. I'm only interested in knowing the patient arrived to the emergency room, the patient was admitted into intensive care or non-intensive care, and then the patient was released. All other details about the process are not relevant for the questions I need to answer. So in that case, you can define a filter that retains all the cases, but within each case only retains those few activities that you want to see, that you need to analyze, and removes all other activities. Though that type of filter is called an event level filter. In other words, all the, as you can see in this tab here where I am currently pointing the cursor, the mouse cursor, all these filters you see here are case level filters. They remove entire cases or they retain entire cases. Sometimes you want to retain all cases, but remove some events. For example, as I said, I might want to know only what happens between the moment somebody goes through emergency room sepsis triage, when they are admitted in intensive care or non-intensive care, 
and when they are released. And these are the activities where the patient is released from the hospital. The other activities that I did not select, I don't care about. So I want to remove those activities that I did not select. So I apply. And what do I get? Look, all the cases have been retained. All 1,150 patients are going to be represented in this filtered event log, but I will only retain 20% of the events in this event log. So I click OK, and what do I see? I see exactly the process as I like it. I only want to see, uh, a, for example, the durations that people spent on average or maximum or minimum, whatever overlay I think, between each of these different uh, phases, ER sepsis triage, admission into intensive care and non-intensive care, and uh, then release from the hospital. And for, for example, for a hospital administrator, this view of the process is exactly what they need because a hospital administrator is not very concerned about what individual treatments the patients undergo. They are more concerned about how much time do patients spend in different parts of the hospital? Because that is necessary for them to be able to make decisions, for example, about how do we have to increase the capacity of our ward or are we okay with the current capacity? Great. So to summarize, there are a number of case filters case level filters, and then there are also event level filters that allow you to retain or remove specific events that you are interested in without removing entire cases. I have given you a demo of them, and I'm ready to move into the next topic. This is a quick topic to tell you that you have to be a little bit careful uh, when you read a process map on the screen because process maps um, have a little bit of a problem distinguishing between two tasks that are executed in parallel and tasks that are repeated after each other. To give you a concrete example, let me give you an event, an event log that contains only two traces, a very, very simple event log. And I'm going to call the activities in this trace, I'm going to call them by, by letters. A is an activity, B, C, and D are other activities. So let me consider four activities, activity A, activity B, C, and D. Right. And I give you an event log with two traces, A, B, C, D. So A followed by B followed by C followed by D and A, C, B, D. They are identical, except that B and C and so are swapped. And if I draw the process map of this event log, I get this thing here. Sorry, this one here at the bottom. So this event log gives me this one. And this one, which is a little bit more complicated, gives me this process map. And in both cases, I notice that there is a loop. From B, I can go to C, look, B to C. And from C, I can go to B. Wow, this is completely different uh, places, right? So from B, I go to C, and from C, I go to B. Yet, these two activities are never repeated. I never saw AC, AC, AC. So the process map gives me this impression that after I start the process, I can do B, and then I can do C, and then I can do B, and then I can do C, and then I can do B, and C, and B, and C, and then I do D. But it's not true. I never saw any repetition in the event log from which I drew this process map. It's an illusion. There is no repetition. But the process map shows you as if they were repeated. Similarly, look at this example. This is an event log with one, two, three, four traces. It gives this process map. And it gives me the impression that C and E are repeated. 
by the way, this is a, a process map that we drew last week uh, during the lecture. And then it, I have the impression that C and E are repeated, but the truth is they are never repeated. I, I either see E and C or C and E, but I never see something like C, E, C, E, C, E. So process maps sometimes give you the illusion that there is repetition, but in fact, there is parallelism. To, to cope with this limitation, when we have a parallelism in the process, when we have parallel activities, it is not a good idea to use process maps to analyze them. It is better to discover a BPMN model from the event log. And there are a, a, several techniques that given an event log and given the corresponding process map, can discover a BPMN model that contains parallel gateways, exclusive choice gateways, inclusive choice gateways. And BPMN has a more uh, sophisticated semantics for distinguishing between choices, parallel branches, and repetitions. So these algorithms can go into the data and discover the process map. And from there, and looking at the data, they, dis they try to separate what is repeated, what is a choice, what is parallelism, and they turn the process map into a BPMN model. That's how these algorithms work. Um, it's not black magic what they do. You know, they are simply identifying certain patterns in the data. And to show you how these algorithms work, let me just take this example here. This is a good example. I just drew it before. And in this example, what do I see? I see always A. Then I see B and C. That I can say it for sure. And then I see always D at the end. So this is more or less the structure of this process. A, B, and C, and D. And then I can see that from A, I can go to B, or I can go to C. And I can also see that from B, I can go to D, and I can go to C. And then I see that B and C can occur in any order. I can either do B followed by C or C followed by B. So what do I deduce if B and C are executed in any order? Well, what I deduce is that there is a parallel branch somewhere here. So from A, I do parallel branch. Then I do B. Or I do C. And then after, after this pattern, B, C, C, B, which is a parallel pattern, then I see some synchronization. So I see an AND gateway here, and then D. So what these algorithms are doing is trying to find the causal dependencies between activities. So A comes between B and C, B and C come before D. And then they look at parallel patterns. Oh, B and C can be executed in any order. They are never repeated. They are just, it's just that they can be executed in any order, B before C or C before B. And then they say, hey, there is parallelism there, and they plug the corresponding parallel gateway. On the other hand, if they see something like, like this, B is followed by C, or B followed by C followed by B followed by C, they will say, hey, these two activities, B and C, are repeated because I see that I, I repeat the multiple time in the same instance where I go from B to C and then back to B. Therefore, there is a repetition between B and C, and then they will capture it using a BPMN repetition pattern instead of a parallel pattern. So you can imagine that they will put A, then they will be putting B, then they will be putting C, and they will be putting D. From A, you can go to B, from B, you can go to C, and from C, you can go, come back to B. There is a repetition. And from C, they go to D. And then these algorithms that discover a BPMN model will take this, these patterns and they will turn it into a nice looking BPMN model. Uh, I'm going to show you concretely using the tool. Discard. 
I'm going to take the same event log. I'm just going to remove all the filters. And I'm going to usually, if you want to discover a BPM and model, you need to first try to make the process map as complex as you can so that there is as many details as possible. So, but still readable. So this is kind of complex, but readable. And what do I see here? Hey, I see these kind of patterns. Look, from, from, from this task, I can go to this task. And from this task, I can go to this task. I, I see it again here, you see? From leukocytes, I could go to admission NC, or from NC, I can go to leukocytes. Um, and uh, similarly, between leukocytes and CRP, look at this pattern here that I am highlighting at the moment. From leukocytes, you can go to CRP. From CRP, you can go to leukocytes. It, it is possible that in this process, there is some parallelism but maybe there is also some repetition. So how can I analyze this process given that there is a mixture perhaps of parallelism and repetition? For that, you need to ask the process mining tool to discover a process model for them, for you. And in a promoter that is done by using this little toggle here, there is in the visualization settings, you can go from the process map to the BPMN model. And this is how the BPMN model of this process looks like. So you can see that after ER sepsis triage, you make a choice. You either go to IV liquid, that is one option. This path goes to intravenous liquid, or in parallel, you do a CRP treatment and maybe you repeat it. You can see here that there is some repetition or you go to in the other branch, you do a, something else, which will be like a lactic acid, apparently, a, or a leukocytes, which is the other treatment that is here. It's a bit of a complicated process. I could try to reduce a tiny bit the complexity to make it look better. So I can use the sliders always to reduce the complexity. Here, it looks a little bit clearer what is happening in this uh, business, in this process. Uh, at this gateway, you do CRP and you might do it many times. And in parallel, you go and do a leukocytes and you can do the leukocytes several times as well. And at any point in time, I can switch between the process map view. Process map views have no gateways, simpler to read, but as you say, sometimes they do not distinguish parallelism from repetition. BPM and Moro, well, a little bit more complex to, to read, but you are familiar with the notation. You know what this means, you know what this means, and you know what this means. Uh, so it's a little bit harder to read. You have to put in more time to understand it, but it gives you a bit of a more complete picture of the relations between different activities in the process. So I have told you a lot about how, how you can use different operations in the process mining tool to understand your business, your business process using an event log. We call that automated process discovery because from the event log, the tool is generating process maps or BPMN models. To summarize, I offer to you a slide with a summary of everything we have seen. When you get an event log, what you can do is to analyze the, 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 process, the structure of the process and the main case variance using the abstraction sliders and the process map. If you want to identify parallelism, branching points and rework loops, if you want to identify parallelism, rework loops, branching points, you should switch to the BPMN view and inspect the behavior of the process around each gateway in the process. Um, if you want to understand where the process can finish, look for the dotted lines in the process map. And these dotted lines that go to the end event, they tell you that the process might end in that activity. Um, so for example, if I take this process, 
here and I put the process map view and uh, I you, you see all these dotted lines that go to the end event. They tell you that the activity that comes before is a final activity. Some, some cases finish with a release B, some cases with release D, some cases with release C, some cases with release E, and some cases finish with a release A, and some cases finish after the patient return to the emergency room. Return ER stands for return to the emergency room. Sometimes it is difficult to analyze the whole process. So it is good to uh, apply some filters and to analyze different subsets of cases of the process. For example, visualize all those cases of patients who are 65 years of older and separately those of patients who are younger. That the less cases you visualize, the simpler is your process map or your BPMN model. And the more chances there are that you will be able to understand how those different subsets of the process are being performed. Then look at the frequency of the activities and try to see which activities are always executed and which activities are just only sometimes executed. And then finally, uh, you can always uh, in, the BP, in, the, in the tool at any point in time, you can go here to the perspective and switch from activities to other perspectives, for example, to groups. And then you will see how different groups or different workers in the process give work to each other. So when I go from the perspective activities to the perspective groups, what I see now are not activities, but groups or teams in the hospital. There is team A, team B, team C, team D, team E. And the process map here is showing you how team A is giving work to team C, and then team C is giving back the work or the patient back to group A. So you can see this is what we call a handoff map. So we have seen uh, how you can discover and understand a process under of an event log. This is one of the main things we do with process mining, but you can do other things with process mining. One of the things you can do with process mining tools is conformance checking. You have now some process model or more typically some business rules that need to be followed. For example, every patient who is admitted into the emergency room must be seen by a nurse within two hours of their arrival. So that's a rule that the hospital uh, management has put in place to ensure, of course, that you know, patients are treated in a timely manner. Naturally, the hospital manager will want to check from time to time if this rule is being fulfilled. And if it's not being fulfilled, they want to know which cases, in which cases it happens, for which patients it happened, so that they can investigate why is it that sometimes we are not treating, we are not looking into patients in a timely manner in the emergency room. So I have a business rule. Every admitted patient into the emergency room must be seen by a nurse within two hours. And then the purpose of conformance checking is to check that this rule is being fulfilled in the event log. And if it's not being fulfilled, to point out to the specific cases and the specific fragments of, of a, a case where the rule is not being fulfilled. So there are two ways of doing conformance checking. You can do conformance checking based on some simple rules like the one I just told you, or based on the entire process models. In this course, to keep things simple, we are going to focus on rule-based conformance checking, meaning we are gonna postulate some rule that needs to be fulfilled by the process, and we are gonna use the process mining tool to check if this rule is being uh, fulfilled. There are different types of business rules that you might want to check using conformance checking. Based on experience, my experience is that there are three recurrent types of business rules that you will find in, a, in an organization and that need to be checked at the level of a business process. There are flow-based rules, 
that tells you, for example, that some activities must always be executed or that some activities must occur after another activity. For example, if I admit a patient into the emergency room, eventually uh, I need to have that patient uh, undergo a leukocytes test. Or if I give a leukocytes test to a patient, eventually that patient should also get another type of test called CRP or take the coronavirus vaccine. If I give you the first dose of the coronavirus vaccine, eventually you should receive the second dose as well. If that is not the case, I want to know it because then that means that we have violated a compliance rule. The second type of compliance rules are service level agreement complaints. And they tell you that between the moment something happens and the moment something else happens, no more than X amount of hours should happen. It could be that between the start of the case and the end of the case, no more than 21 days span. Or it might be that between the moment I receive you in the emergency room and the moment I, a, a nurse sees you, no more than two days should elapse. And finally, there are resource constraints. And those tell you, for example, that a given task must be executed by a certain type of resource. For example, invoices must always be approved by a certain type of employee. They cannot be approved by any employee. They have to be approved by this specific type of employee. So for example, the, the invoice should be created usually by a different person who, by, by, than, than the one who approves the invoice, because we want that several people are involved in the, in the payment of an invoice. Because if a single employee is able to do all the steps all the way to paying the employee, that can lead to frauds because nobody else is checking that this employee is not just sending money to his friend or to her friend or sending money to themselves. So that's why there are policies in an organization that force that there has to be certain checks and that these checks have to be done by different people so that there is no, there is less probability of there being fraud uh, in the organization. And bear in mind that financial fraud in organizations is actually pretty, pre a, a very big deal. And, and it costs a lot to organizations the, uh, every day, this type of financial fraud. So, so companies are always trying to set in place certain policies to ensure that they, are, they don't suffer from internal financial fraud in their organization. Double paid invoices as well are very, very common uh, in, out there in large organizations. And of course, these large organizations need to put in place certain policies to ensure that an invoice does not get paid twice, which sounds like, oh, it shouldn't happen. But you know, it happens from time to time. Um, so uh, to, to, uh, to check this type of compliance rules, um, there, is, there are two things you need to know. First of all, I'm going to go back to the activities perspective. If I simply want to check a constraint of the type, is an activity always performed or is it sometimes skipped? The best way to do it is to go to the relative case view of the process and then put all the nodes. And the relative case view here, when I select relative case in the frequency overlay, it tells me in what percentage of cases each activity is performed. 100%, like for example, emergency room registration is performing 100% of cases, means that this activity is performed in every case. So here I can see that emergency room registration is always performed in every case. Emergency room triage is always performed in every case. But I can see that emergency room sepsis triage is not performed in every case. It's performed 99.9% .9 of cases, which means there are some cases where it is not being performed, right? Uh, and the same for CRP. CRP is not performed all the time. 
is only performing 96% of cases. Now, let me imagine I wanted to know um, how come this activity ER sepsis triage, which means a nurse looked at a patient uh, and tried to send them to a particular doctor for examination, how come there, is some, there are some cases where this does not occur? Let me try to figure that out. To figure that out, I can now use an attribute filter. I can use, I can say, I want to find those cases where this activity called ER sepsis triage is not performed. So you have to negate the rule. And this is going to be very common in conformance checking. You define a rule and then you negate it. And the way I recommend you to capture those situations where you have to define a business rule and then negate it is like define the filter corresponding to the rule. So the rule is that in every case, ER sepsis triage should occur. And then click here on the remove option, which makes that a promoter is going to find those cases, is going to remove those cases where ER sepsis triage occurs. Hence, it's only going to retain those cases where ER sepsis triage does not occur. So I apply this rule and I find that there is one case, one single case where this is happening. I can click on it here and I can see the identifier of the case and I can see exactly what happened in this case. What happened is that somebody arrived, he was quickly seen by a nurse in the general section of the emergency room and the nurse sent that patient straight into leukocytes. Normally that nurse should have sent them to the cancer department. And in the cancer department, there should have been another nurse who will then examine them again and send them into a leukocytes treatment. But apparently that second step was skipped in this process instance. And therefore the rule that every patient who goes to the sepsis section of the hospital has to be seen by a nurse in the cancer ward was not respected. But it only happened for one case. And the second type of compliance rules that you will often see is that after an activity, some other activity should occur. So if you want to capture that kind of rules that after an activity, some other activities should occur, like for example, uh, after the emergency room triage, the patient should go to, um, after, after the emergency room triage, the patient should go to emergency room sepsis triage. If I want to enforce that rule, I will use a path filter. The path filter allows me to capture exactly that kind of rules. This happened and later that happened. So for example, I can, I can try to retrieve all cases where emergency room triage occurred and eventually emergency room sepsis triage occurs. Or another example, let me find all those cases where a lactic acid was performed and then a leukocyte was performed. And let me say that this is something that should not occur normally uh, after lactic acid, we should not have leukocytes. So I'm gonna click on remove to say, I want to remove those cases where there was lactic acid followed by leukocytes. So I want to only retain those cases where after lactic acid, there was no leukocytes. And then I find that there are uh, 685 cases where after lactic acid, there is no leukocytes treatment. I'm gonna illustrate this maybe in a more realistic way. That was not a very realistic way of illustrating it. Let me assume I want to find if there are cases where after an emergency room registration, I do not see emergency room triage, right? So, and, and I don't care whether they immediately follow each other or they eventually follow each other. So I will say eventually follows. So I want all the cases where emergency room registration was eventually followed by emergency room triage. Normally, that's how it should be. 
So I'm gonna now remove those cases where this did not happen. If it gives me an empty log, this is very good. It means that all the cases are following this pattern, this path. Emergency room registration is eventually followed by emergency room triage. Perfect. If there are some cases in this filter log, after I apply this filter, then it's bad. It means there are cases where this path is not being followed. So I apply and the tool tells me there are six cases where this is not happening and this is not normal. So there are six cases where after emergency room registration, which is supposed to be the first task in this process, I do not see emergency room triage. And when I filter the log to retain those cases where this happened, what do I see? It's like there are six cases where I start, I'm gonna put the case frequency, there are six cases where I start the process with the emergency room triage. And it turns out in this process, it shouldn't be the case. Emergency room registration should happen before emergency room triage. You can see, if you click here on the number of cases, you can see exactly for which cases that happen. And this is very useful because then you can go and talk to the corresponding nurses of these cases and find out why it happened. Guess what? This is a real life process. And what happened is that sometimes the patients arrive into the emergency room and the receptionist in the emergency room are very busy and they do not immediately record the patient arrival. So they try to catch up one or two hours later. And then the event emergency room registration is only recorded later in the process. So I arrived 2 a.m. in the emergency room, but I was recorded as arriving at 4 a.m. because there was so much, there was so, so much of a queue in the emergency room that the receptionist did not have time to record my arrival. The other type of uh, rules that you will need to check are SLA constraints. Like for example, I might want to check that between the moment a patient arrives to the emergency room and the moment they undergo ER sepsis triage, no more than two hours should pass. Let me check if that is always the case. So I define again a path filter. Path filters are going to be your big friends when it comes to doing conformance checking. And I want to catch cases where emergency room registration happen, eventually, not immediately after, but eventually, ER sepsis triage happen, and more than two hours elapse between these two events. This more than two hours elapse, yeah, more than two hours elapse. This should not happen, this is bad. I shouldn't, it shouldn't be the case that it takes more than two hours between the moment I arrive to the emergency room and the moment I am seen by a nurse in the sepsis department. So I apply this, this uh, thing and I see that indeed there are 29 cases out of 1,100. These are the specific cases where the amount of time between the moment a patient registers to the emergency room and the moment they are seen by a nurse in the cancer department is more than two hours. And then you can start investigating why it happened. Maybe it only happens in the weekends, on Saturdays, at night, because we don't have, because there's maybe only one nurse at that point in time in the sepsis department. So that means that we need to allocate more resources to the Saturday shift, because otherwise there are patients that are there in an emergency situation waiting for two, two hours to see an, a, a, an appropriate nurse. And the final type of constraint that you might want to check is the, the uh, resource constraints. I will illustrate it to you using a different event log. For example, in this process, there is a page, there is a, an activity uh, called release suppliers invoice. 
and there is an activity called authorized suppliers invoice patient. This means that the, the supplier's invoice has been entered into the system, and this means that it has been paid. If you want to check this type of rules, go to the path filter, always to check rules, use the path filter, select the first activity, release supplier's invoice, select the second activity, authorize supplier's invoice payment, select the eventually follows relation, and make sure that you require that the same person is doing both activities. So by saying I require that the same, sorry, the same resource is performing both activities, I am ensuring that I will retrieve those cases where the purchase or the invoice was released by the same person who approved its approval. So the same resource performed both activities, the release of the invoice and the authorization of the payment of the invoice. And that should never happen. If there is a case that fulfills this rule, you, it means that we have violated the compliance rule. It means that I enter the invoice into the system and I authorize the payment. Imagine I could then arrange in such a way that I pay to myself or to a friend or to a relative if I do it that way. And it is very useful to check that that is actually not happening. You will do a very similar exercise to this one in the, in the practice sessions uh, in an hour or two. So you're gonna come back to this topic. I give you a table now that summarizes what we saw before. If you want to check for conformance of your process executions against business rules, you should capture your rules at the level of flow constraints, SLA or temporal constraints, and uh, resource compliance constraints. And you should then use either the attribute filter or the path filter to filter out those cases that are violating your compliance rules. And once you have them, then you are halfway of your way into determining why is it that the compliance is being violated. Finally, or not finally, but almost finally, process mining also allows you to analyze the performance of your process. Uh, specifically, using process mining, you can uh, uh, enhance your process maps uh, or your BPMN models with frequency statistics or duration statistics like waiting times or processing times. And this then allows you to do several types of analysis to identify bottlenecks in your process, places in the process where you are spending a lot of time or a lot of effort. Workload analysis, which is trying to identify if some of the workers called resources in your process are overloaded, have too much workload, and therefore they are affecting the execution times in the process. And rework analysis, where you try to identify if there are some loops in your process that are repeated, because when you are repeating some activities in your process, it usually means that you are doing your process inefficiently, and then you need to be able to uh, detect that, determine how much this is slowing down your process, and therefore take corrective actions to avoid that things get repeated in your process. Uh, in, in respect to bottleneck analysis, there are three concepts I need you to retain. One of them is the when you are looking at a process map and you switch to the duration perspective and you are looking at the average duration, for example, it is very useful that you look for the activity that has the highest waiting times, meaning all the arcs coming to this activity are have high waiting times. In the process map, you can detect that because all the arcs are color coded. And you can see here that there is an activity that indeed has a bit of a problem because there is a dark color arc here, a dark color arc here, and a dark color arc here, and another one here. 
and all of them go into the same activity. This indicates that this activity is a capacity bottleneck. There are not enough people available to perform that activity and therefore the waiting times, remember the times in the arcs are waiting times. So the waiting times to start that activity are very high. But it's also useful to identify also the activity processing bottleneck. The activity processing bottleneck is the activity in your process that is taking the largest amount of time to execute. So in this case, the activity bottleneck is this one. It takes about one hour to execute. This is the task called deliver goods. It's kind of natural that it takes time because you know, deliveries take time. They go through couriers, etc. As it turns out, that is not a big issue, but it means that you are spending uh, a lot of effort in that activity. And if you wanted to make your process more efficiently, you probably should try to look for ways of making this activity faster. And finally, there are, you need to also be on the lookout for arcs in the process, isolated arcs here and there that have very long waiting times. We call those ones slow handoffs. So that means that between one activity and another, there is, between this particular pair of activities, there is a very slow handoff happening. Um, and uh, so those are the three kinds of bottlenecks you need to identify. These activities that have all dark incoming arcs, these are capacity bottlenecks. Those activities that have a high processing time, they are dark red. Those are the activity bottlenecks. And also for any other arcs that, have, that are very dark, and which means they have a very high processing time. And all these, you can do it by switching to the duration perspective in your process map. And the same analysis can be done by switching to the process view. So let me show you that on the repair example, which is the one that was shown in these slides. If I click on the duration view, I can see the, the, the times. These are waiting times. These are uh, processing times. What do I see? This is the activity bottleneck. Is the activity that is taking the largest amount of time. There is a very slow handoff to that activity, but you, you see that there is also um, a capacity bottleneck apparently in test repair. Uh, no, it's a slow handoff between informing the user and test repair. And there is also a slow handoff between test repair and restart repair. There is an activity bottleneck here, takes a long time. There is a slow handoff here and a slow handoff here. And there is another slow handoff here. That's what I can see in this process. And I can also at any point in time, switch to the resources perspective on the here. And then I will display the same type of map, but on the resource perspective. So that the boxes are not activities, they are workers. And I can see that the worker that is the resource bottleneck is Solver SC3. He is the one who is taking the longest amount of time on average to perform an activity. This brings me to the second topic, which is workload analysis. It is very useful also to, in addition to identifying your bottlenecks, to also identify your uh, overuse resources or underuse resources. Which resources have too much work and which resources have too little work? When you switch in the, in, the, in the process discoverer, you switch to the process map view, you will immediately see color coded which resources are involved in a lot of cases in the process and which resources are only involved in a few cases. The darker, the more they are involved. So here I can see, for example, that there is a resource here, another one here, and another one here that are quite overloaded. So we can say these resources are very often used. So in, in, in this, um, let me go here. If I go to the frequency view, click on frequency, I can see that there is a result here called system that has a lot of tasks. 
Well, it turns out that these are automated tasks. So there's a lot of them. You very often perform automated tasks in this process, but that doesn't mean that this resource is overloaded because it's, a, it's an automated machine. Uh, one thing that can be useful in these cases is to try to get rid of this activity because if I want to investigate workload, I'm not interested too much in the workload of the system, but rather in the workload of the people. So I can use an event filter. I go to event and I remove that, or oh, oh, I go to the resource perspective and I remove those events that are performed by the system. So I apply this filter and I go here and I think that the system is no longer there. And now I can see that my testers appear to be quite overloaded all my testers are performing lots of activities, more so than the solvers. However, and then you have to do a second check, that doesn't mean that they are, that the solver testers are more overloaded than the solvers. They are doing more tasks, but maybe they are taking less time per task. So to get a full picture of it, you go to the duration view and you select the total duration. And that means that you are going to see how much time each resource is spending cumulatively in the process. So a resource performs one task, another task, another task, another task. If you add up all the time they spend doing all these tasks, you get their total duration in the process, the total amount of time they spend in the process. When I am in the duration total view, I can see that solver S3, C3, is by far the one that is spending the largest amount of time in this process. And then I can ask myself questions like, well, what happens? What is the difference in cycle time between cases where solver C3 is involved and cases where solver C3 is not involved? And that will, by comparing the times when solver C3 is involved versus the cycle times when solver C3 is not involved, you can get a good picture of what is the impact of solver C3 being involved in a case on the total execution time of the case? And that gives you the, a very good idea of whether or not you need to add one more resource to work next to this resource called solver C3. I can also see that solver S3 is quite overloaded because there are lots of waiting times leading to it and the same for solver S1. Well, clearly the solvers are causing a lot of waiting times because all the arcs that go into those solvers have a very long waiting time in the arcs. Remember the times in the arcs are waiting times that are the times inside each activity are processing times. The next thing you do in an analysis of a process is look for rework loops and try to isolate those loops and try to find if there are uh, cases where the loops occur and we do not, cases where they do not occur. Loops are very important in the analysis of a process because usually a loop, a repetition, indicates that in your process there is a, a rework loop. I'm gonna go to the activities view and the frequency view, and uh, I'm gonna remove all the filters I have. And what do I see, particularly if I move to the BPMN view? I see that indeed there is some repetition in this process. After, I usually I repair, repair simple, repair complex. I inform the user, I test the repair. And sometimes I finish and I archive the repair, but other times, 293 times, I am restarting the repair and I am repairing again. So in this process, there is repetition of the repair activities. Now, how do I extract those cases where there is repetition? There is a specific filter for it. The very last filter I will introduce called rework and repetition filter. And in that rework and repetition filter, you can specify that you want to extract or remove those cases where a given activity is repeated. For example, if I want to retrieve here those activities where repair complex is repeated, I will say, please retrieve those cases where 
Reaper complex is executed two or more times. The number of executions is greater than or equal to two. And if I apply this filter, I will retrieve only 51 cases out of 1,100. And these 51 cases are cases where repair complex is repeated. And, and I can then compare the execution time of those cases where this activity is repeated, which is 1.63 hours. I can then compare it to those cases where this activity is not repeated. And that will give me a good idea of by how much this rework loop is contributing to slowing down my process. This is a table summarizing the different types of analysis that you will do to analyze the performance of your process using a process mining tool. Bottleneck analysis, switch to the resource perspective and then do workload analysis, and then switch back to the activity perspective and use the rework filter to find repetitions rework that might be slowing down your process. So, and the right-hand side of this table tells you how to do each of these operations. The final operation in process mining is called variance analysis. Variance analysis means that you are going to take two logs, you're gonna take your log and you're gonna split it into two or more, and then you are going to compare them in order to identify reasons why something is going wrong or reasons why something is being done well. So the whole idea of variant analysis is, is, is take two variants of your process, take, separate your event log into two corresponding to different variants of your process, and then compare them to try to find their differences. The first thing you need to do for variant analysis is to split your event log. There are different ways of splitting the event log, but in practice, I have found that there are three very common ways. Very often you want to split your log and say, let me retrieve those cases that takes less than 21 days. Let me separate those cases that take more than 21 days. And now let me compare them. You can also uh, uh, do logical partitioning. You can say, let me retrieve those cases where the patient has less than 65 years, cases where the patient has more than 65 years. That is a logical division, an attribute-based division. And then let me compare them to find out what are we going doing differently for aged patients versus young patients. Or you might want to split an event log of an order to cash process in a, in a Baltic company and split it into countries. Those cases that happen in Estonia are separated from those that happen in Latvia, which are separated from those that happen in Lithuania. And then you might want to start comparing them. For example, to figure out why is it that the process in Latvia is performing better than the same process in Estonia. Or, and finally, you might want to do a temporal split. For example, compare what happened in 2019 versus what happened in 2020 to understand what was the impact of COVID lockdowns on your process. For example, why, where specifically did the COVID uh, had an impact on slowdowns in your cycle times? So you split it your event load by time frame, take all the cases that happened in 2019 all the cases that happened in 2020, and you compare them. Once you have done that, uh, and you can do this split using the filters, performance filter, attribute filter, or time frame filter, then you can save the corresponding process maps, uh, event logs into the workspace, and you can start comparing them. Let me show you concretely what this means. This process um, sometimes takes less than an hour, sometimes takes more than one hour. Let me see in the performance filter, I can see that if I set the, the, the boundary to one hour and I retain only those cases that took less than one hour, that's what I'm doing, retaining cases that took one hour or less. 
I will find that there are about 533 cases that took less than one hour, which is about 48% of cases. This is the event log containing only those 48% of cases. I can go here on the top left corner and save this event log, and I'll call this less than one hour. Oh, sorry, less. Less than one hour. Whoa. So I saved the event log with the cases that took less than an hour. And now I'm going to do exactly the opposite. I'm going to remove, instead of retaining those cases that took less than one hour, I'm going to remove those cases that took less than an hour, which means I'm going to retain those cases that took more than one hour. And there are 51% of them, of those cases. I click on OK. This is the filter event log. And I go to save. And I call this more than one hour. And now in my portal, I have two new event logs. The repair log for those cases that took less than one hour and the repair log that took for cases that took more than one hour. And I compare the, can compare them in different ways. I'm going to show you two ways of doing it. One of them is select both event logs, go to analyze and go to view performance dashboard. And this is going to open a performance dashboard that will allow you to compare the two event logs. In every chart in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, in, in every chart you will see here, there will be a data series for the cases that took less than an hour and a data series for the cases that took more than an hour. So for example, this is the, the chart of the active cases over time. And I can see that, well, truth is that the reds, which are the less than an hour, and the blues, which are the more than an hour, are more or less equally spread. And the same when I see the number of events that occur every day, they are equally spread. Um, Naturally, the red cases took less than an hour and the blue case more than an hour. That's what I expected. If I go to the activities tab, I will then be able to compare the case frequencies, the, the activity frequencies, how often different activities occur. And what do I find? I find a very striking pattern. Inform user occurs more or less the same amount of time, analyze defect the same amount of time, register the same amount of time, test repair the same amount of times, archive repair the same. Repair complex occurs a little bit more often in those cases that took more than one hour versus those cases that took less than an hour. But restart repair occurred much more often in cases that took more than an hour than in cases that took less than an hour. Just to confirm, it's good to make this chart in relative scale. Relative scales make things more comparable. So in case the two event logs have different sizes, it's normal that one activity occurs more often in the log with more cases. In, in case that is, if that is happening, then relative scale will compensate for it. And if relative scale shows me that in the cases that take less than an hour, an activity occurs more frequently than in the cases that it took less than one hour, it probably means that there is a pattern in there. So what is the pattern I see here? That those cases where the repair is restarted are often the ones that lead to execution times or cycle times of more than one hour in this process. So I have found a potential cause for the fact that some cases are taking more than an hour. And you can do this analysis also on the resources perspective. Here you have a chart. Um, I can, here you have the chart of which resources are involved in the cases that take more than one hour and those that take less than an hour. And I can see some, some patterns in here. For example, solver S3 is very infrequently, no, I don't see a lot of patterns here, except maybe for tester three is more often involved in cases that take less than one hour, 
whereas tester one is more often involved in cases that take more than an hour. That's pretty much the only pattern I see here, there. So, and the second way you can compare is much, it's, a, it's more or less the same, but you can see more the structure of the process is just open the process map of one of your process in one browser window. I do it here. And you can, there is a button for laying down vertically this thing. And then open a second browser window and go to uh, a, a prom the same, a promoter cloud. And open the other log. This is the less than an hour. Now I'm going to open in this window the more than one hours. I'm going to lay it vertically. And then I can put myself in any perspective or overlay and start comparing. What is the difference between these two? Well, it's pretty obvious. In these cases, more than less than one hour, when I restart, I restart with simple. Test repair, restart, repair, restart simple. And in those cases that take more than one hour, when I usually, when I restart the repair, I, after analyze effect, I do repair complex. And then um, after the test repair, I go to test repair, I restart simple. So I see a little bit more of this repair complex, test repair, restart repair, repair simple, test repair. And that's not a pattern I observed in here. So that might be one of the reasons, these rework loops might be one of the reasons behind the differences between cases that take more than an hour and take cases that take less than an hour. And you can do the same type of comparisons to compare cases that take place in one country versus another, or cases where the customer complained versus cases where the customer did not complain. And this concludes what I wanted to tell you about process mining. Uh, I give you a table with some instructions on how to do variant analysis along the flow perspective, the frequency perspective, rework, and the bottleneck perspective. And to finish up, what we saw is that from an event log, you can discover your process using automated process discovery, process maps or BPM and models. You can check the that your process is following certain compliance rules or not. You can then uh, mine the performance of your process and find bottlenecks, high workload or rework. And you can compare two variants of your process, temporal variants or logical variants, and find differences between them that can help you to explain why is it that in some cases you're performing better than in other cases. That's what I wanted to tell you. And